Well, hi all. My name is Steve Bromage, Executive Director of Maine Historical Society. It's my pleasure to welcome you this evening. Uh, we are deeply appreciative to Edward Ball for his willingness to take the time to be with us tonight. We really appreciate it. Uh, tonight's program is part of the launch of Maine Historical Society's new exhibition, Begin Again, Reckoning with Intolerance in Maine, which opens in our gallery tomorrow. I was just down there and it's in fact just about ready to go, so that's good. Um, the exhibit and company program series explores how Maine fits into the national dialogue about race that has exploded with, in such powerful ways this past year. You know, here we are, a year ago yesterday was George Floyd's murder, and um, this exhibit really is inspired by that in, in many, many ways. So um, I'm glad we can mark that moment by continuing the dialogue. Um, in the exhibit, um, through collection stories and a hard look at some less well-known but really critical aspects of Maine history, the exhibit seeks to provide information, context, and a place to reflect and challenge one's own understanding uh, some, and assumptions both about race and about Maine. It's really <clears throat> illuminating, I think, in a lot of ways. Begin Again is curated by community members Darren Ranko, Crystal Williams, Ann Gass, and MHS's own Tilly Lasky. And this really continues the trend we've had for exhibits, our exhibits the last number of years with working really closely with community members to help bring different perspectives and stories into the uh, exhibits and, and that we're sharing in a framing dialogue. Um, there's a great, I, want, I, I direct you for more information, some background on the exhibit. There's a, a great blog that the curators have done. And then a couple of weeks ago, they did a really neat panel that kind of gets you into the curatorial approach and some of the stories. Um, both of those are available on our website. So check that out if you want to kind of see how it all came together and what the real focus and emphasis is. Um, so it's a real, it's really a true honor, honor to have Edward Ball with us to help us con, uh, continue this dialogue. Edward's books have in fact had a huge influence both on me personally and I think by extension uh, by on Maine Historical Society. His work starts in the present day and examines how we grapple with history's leg legacies in our own personal lives. And um, Slaves in the Family, I think, was published in 1998. And I was done graduate school and working documentaries and other things. And there was this, this real presentism, like how do we grapple and contend and understand how the history shapes us, which is so dynamic. And I think that so much of MHS's work is reflects that kind of approach today. His book, Slaves in the Family, uh, looks really deeply at his family's own history as slaveholders in South Carolina. And it's really fascinating the way he goes back and he looks back at his own ancestors and how they've come down through the generations. But he also finds the, the ancestors or the descendants of the, the slaves they owned. And it's a really interesting and intertwined look at, at these legacies and how we how our stories are connected and how we carry them forward. Um, so uh, great, great book. Edward has taught at Yale University and has been awarded fellowships by the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard uh, and New York Public Library's Coleman Center. He's also the recipient of a Public Scholar Award from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, and his newest book uh, really picks up on that, uh, on the work he did in Slaves and in the Family, Life of a Klansman, A Family History with White Supremacy, he returns to that subject. And in this case, he, he tells the story of a family patriarch who was a, really a warrior in the Ku Klux Klan, the carpenter in Louisiana right after the Civil War who kind of gets involved in fanatical uh, racism. So it's a, it's a really uh, interesting uh, retrospect, introspective look at, at family and, and how we carry these, these legacies, um, many of which aren't as attractive as we'd like. So anyway, but Edward is going to talk to us about that. And it's my pleasure to uh, introduce and turn it over to you, to Edward. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Hi. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much, Steve Bromwich. And also, I would like to thank Kathleen Neumann of the Maine Historical Society for inviting me to be with you tonight. Thank you to the folks of Portland, the mother city of Maine, and in some ways, some would say, of New England. I want to talk about the Ku Klux. The Ku Klux, which is a phrase that my grandparents' generation used in Louisiana to refer to the group the militias, the Ku Klux. These are words that show a familiarity which only people who knew actual members and marauders in the white supremacist movement could use. Members of the Ku Klux Klan from 150 years ago 
when they came together, did not see themselves as founders of a movement. They would not have thought that their great, great grandchildren would be talking about them. And yet, not only are we talking about the Ku Klux, the angry and ignorant and vicious gangs of reconstruction, men who disguised themselves and hurt and sometimes killed people. Not only are we talking about them, we are circulating ideas today that recall those of the Ku Klux, and we are perpetrating acts today that resemble those carried out by the first clans. El Paso, Texas. August 2019, a marauder, a white terrorist, kills 22 people and ruins the lives of hundreds. And he writes a manifesto that talks about white supremacy as his guiding idea. Let me take you to Charlottesville, Virginia in August 2017 White supremacists take over a city, beat up a lot of people, and kill one person. These people use language that Klansmen once coined and symbols that announce white racial identity. So the number 14 on the shield is a fairly new sign. It refers to a creed in a sentence, the 14-word manifesto of David Lane, founder of a supremacist cell called the Order, the 14 words, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. Let's go to June 2015, Charleston, South Carolina, the Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church. A 21-year-old man goes to this church and sits in a prayer meeting. The 11 people there have their books open to the parable of the sower. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. And he kills nine people. He too writes a manifesto calling for a separate white nation. Let's go to January 6, 2021 at the US Capitol, where a marauding mob, a large gang, some of them carrying white supremacist symbols, takes over the capital. Five people died as a consequence of that event. The assault on the capital may not be a Klan operation, but it drew energies from the barely submerged river of white supremacist thought and action a river that originates with the Ku Klux Klan. These are symbols and images visible at the January 6 riot. We are in a moment, a phase that's lasted several years that is punctuated by violent white supremacy. Since 2015, some 250 people have died from white supremacist violence that announces itself as racial vengeance. And that does not include the police killings of unarmed African-Americans. The status of those killings in the discussion of racial power can be argued. Recent years seem to me like a return, like a remembrance of things past. It seems familiar despite the grotesque uniqueness of these many acts. Now, why are these things familiar? Today, I want to tell a story about where it all began. When I was a boy, I lived for a lot of years in Louisiana, down in the South in New Orleans. That's the home of my mother's family. My mother's people have lived in New Orleans for about 200 years. My father's family are all from Charleston, South Carolina, on the other side of the Southeast, having lived there for 300 years. My father's family is the family about whom I wrote that book, Slaves in the Family. 
that Steve mentioned. I lived with my family in Charleston for a different part of my childhood. In New Orleans, my mother's family have been and remain very plain people. They are clerks, tradesmen, school teachers, salesmen, carpenters, nurses, nobody at all with a higher education for 150 years until the 1970s. So when we arrived in New Orleans, we went there when I was about 10, we moved in with my grandmother into her bungalow, raised up against the floods that plague the city near Tulane University in the Carrollton district. Living with my grandmother also was a woman named Maud, my grandmother's sister, Maud LaCorn. And it was with Aunt Maud that I first learned about our clansmen. Now in the deep South, in many families, whether black or white or mixed race, there is often a family historian, usually a woman, a person who tells the family story to the rest of the group she emphasizes the nice things and she locks up the embarrassing stories. She keeps the lists of births and deaths and marriages. She builds family trees. Aunt Maud was that person among my mother's people. She was about 75 when I first paid attention. She was a school teacher and she was unmarried, never married. She wore horn rimmed glasses. She wore her long hair usually twisted up and bunched tight in a bun at the crown of her head. She had pursed lips. She owned a closet of gingham dresses, knee length with long sleeves. Come here, boy. Let me tell you about our people. Our people, the Lacorns. The first one of our group to come here to New Orleans was a man named Eve Lacorn, who came from Brittany on the west coast of France. He was a sailor in Napoleon's Navy. And I will tell you, and you will learn this in school, that Napoleon was involved in war from one end of the earth to the other. And Eve was one of his junior officers. And so the Emperor Napoleon sent a flotilla of ships to the Caribbean because there was an uprising in Saint-Domingue. That's the place they now call Haiti. When the ship arrived, Eve got off and he never got back on. And he put down his roots here. Eve Lacorn, who's about 28, found himself a bride who was about 19 and her name was Marguerite Zorang from a great sugar planting family in Bayou Le Fouche. This is a picture I have on my wall of the Zorang plantation. They had too many daughters and the family was in decline. And so they consented or they condescended to marry off this daughter, Marguerite, to a sailor who'd washed in from the mother country. I say the mother country because everybody in this story is French. Of course, they were speaking French. And despite the Americans having bought Louisiana from Napoleon, they remain French. Our people were French, you understand. And the French ain't going to give up their language for no Americans. And they remain French for another hundred years. And Eve and Marguerite moved into a little Creole cottage on Rue Dauphine in the French Quarter where they had five children. Among them was my grandfather, Constant Le Corn. Constant Le Corn. He was a redeemer. Do you know about the redemption? The redemption, that was after the Civil War, when the colored people had taken over the state. They started businesses. They were acting as though everything was theirs and they were voting. The redemption was after that time they called Reconstruction that awful time. Reconstruction was not when the South tried to rebuild itself after the war between the states. 
It was not when the houses were rebuilt. No, reconstruction was when they put colored people in the seat of power. The redemption were the people who resisted that. And so my grandfather, Constant, he was a redeemer. His first name was Polycarp. He didn't like it. He used his middle name, Constant. He wanted to restore white supremacy, white rule. He got up and he got himself tied up with that white league. The white league, now the only difference between the white league and the Ku Klux is that the Ku Klux were secretive and the white league were not. They were out in the open. What the Ku Klux did in secret at night, the white league did out in the open. And thank God for the White League, because they put the Negra out of the seat of power. And so it was from Aunt Maud, the family historian, that I first learned about our Klansmen. <clears throat> Thirty years later, Maud having died, my parents having died, I'm cleaning out the family house and I find a batch of files labeled Le Corn. I begin to read them. They're her files. And I make a decision to tell the story of our clansmen. I go back and forth from my home in Connecticut to New Orleans to look in the archives. I hire a researcher to help excavate the documentary record and a life story begins to take shape. Constant Le Corne was born in 1832 to a French family in New Orleans. He was the second of three sons. His parents give his older brother the education and Constant goes into a trade. He grows up a small, thin man, nervous and alert, sharp features, skinny nose, beautiful hands, an underbite, and a furrowed brow, a long wave of dark hair which turned white early. Constant's parents were of the white class who start high and then lose their economic advantage. This is Dauphine Street on which they lived in New Orleans. But they were also among the one quarter of whites who enslaved people. Constant's mother inherited eight enslaved people from her parents who had been planters. Constant's parents, having inherited these people, sell four of them and use the money to build a house. This is what we would call politely intergenerational white wealth. I don't know what happened to these four people. Constant's parents keep with them four other enslaved people named Ovid, Polly, Valentine, and Dinah. This is a sale receipt, a sale contract for the sale of Ovid, Constant's right-hand man and workman. Constant's father was a supercargo, so-called. He's a person who accompanied freight on ships that sailed around the Gulf. But he dies at age 54 when Constant is eight and his mother cannot make the family work. She has five minor children. She can't make the family work without the four enslaved people. She hires them out. She rents them to whites more prosperous than she is, and that becomes the family income. At age 24 in 1856, Constant marries Gabrielle Duchemin, age 19, an orphan of French descent from the Caribbean island of Martinique, and he becomes a ship carpenter. She becomes a seamstress. He, as a ship carpenter, works the barges and the steamboats along the Mississippi River. In 1860, as the Civil War approaches, Constant and his wife Gabrielle live in a rented house with their two children, who are now grown. 
This is the house that they lived in <clears throat> in 1860 on Levy Street, running right along beside Mississippi. His parents, his, his children are not grown, they're growing up, pardon me. Constant's parents are dead. His mother, when she died, gave her enslaved people to her five children who were grown. Constant and Gabrielle received two enslaved people, Ovid and Dinah. And then the war begins. Constant fights for the Confederacy, as do 50,000 other white men in Louisiana. He and his wife invest in the fight, buying Confederate bonds, and they lose their money. When he comes home after three years, he is sick, exhausted, and bitter. He arrives in the city full of carpetbaggers and with the Negroes twice as numerous, as my Aunt Maud would put it. Now with three children, LeCorn finds his livelihood wrecked and their enslaved people are free and gone. Louisiana is occupied by the U.S. Army. New Orleans is crowded with black freed people. About 350,000 African Americans in Louisiana are emancipated. Many thousands leave the plantations, the sugar and cotton plantations, where they were enslaved and moved to New Orleans. Constant, as a carpenter, now competes with black craftsmen to make a living, and he does badly. Constant, I think, now this is my great, great grandfather. I will start calling him by his surname, LeCorn. LeCorn felt himself a victim. He saw the new world as anathema and he descended into resentment. The government was pro-Negro and the coloreds actually held office, which was a genuine perversion. Reconstruction had just begun. Reconstruction was the name of the first attempt to remake the U.S. as a racially mixed democracy. To some, not least to four million ex-slaves, it meant power sharing with whites, maybe even wealth sharing, and somewhere in the distance, shared humanity. These fantastical ideas, called radical reconstruction by their millions of white opponents, met mass obstruction and violent defiance. The Ku Klux Klan arose in Tennessee probably in 1866, soon after the end of the Civil War. It was a resistance movement. It was an armed militia that wanted to return to a world run by whites, dominated by whites, with only whites in economic and political authority. The name Ku Klux derives from the Greek kuklos, or circle, and gangs, as everyone knows, often dressed in costumes and masks. Klansmen made a cult of disguise, wearing hoods to avoid identification by the army occupiers. Klansmen also knew their victims personally and preferred to torment them anonymously. In Louisiana, however, the Klan used other names. The Knights of the White Camellia was one in which Le Corn would participate. The White League was another. The Innocents, a third. In Mississippi was the White Line. In North Carolina, the Red Shirts. The KKK is as wide as the South for about eight years. And alongside it, there were these parallel militias. An early disguise of the white brigades was the costume of firemen. Volunteer fire companies in New Orleans were overstaffed and armed and made up of entire Confederate companies. Constance Lecorn's fire company was called Home Hook and Ladder, made up of his former Company C in the 14th Regiment of the Confederate Army. 
Lacorn took the extreme step and joined the armed resistance. He became a guerrilla fighter who wanted to return the South to white rule. He became a clansman, one of the foot soldiers. Our clansman was not a leader, but a follower. The first major explosion in New Orleans occurred in July, 1866. And circumstantial evidence is preponderant that Constant Le Corn was there. At the Mechanics Institute, a meeting hall for tradesmen, during a convention to agitate for the black vote. Home Hook and Ladder was on the scene to break up that meeting of African American men and some of their white allies. And then the shooting started. An assault of Klan rage left some 200 black people dead, according to one newspaper editor who was witness to the events. Now this was a massacre about voting. And it may be relevant to observe that much of the fight during and since the election of 2020 was about voting, who gets to vote, whose votes are counted, especially when it is black people who are voting. During the next eight years, evidence shows Le Corn and perhaps 5,000 others in the state of Louisiana, the whole of them called Ku Klux by the public, raided, marched, and beat people. Le Corn seems to have joined a group called the Knights of the White Camellia, led by a family friend named Alcibiade de Blanc. The aim of the Knights was to reverse black gains since emancipation by any means necessary and to gain supremacy once again for whites. The knights of the white camellia were costumed and hooded. This is uh, this book that I'm talking about right now. And I thought I'd read a scene from the initiation ceremony of the Knights of the White Camellia. The Knights of the White Camellia hold a convention in New Orleans. It is a recruitment drive. The white newspapers know that Alcibiade de Blanc is running the event, but they honor the guerrillas by publishing nothing. Hundreds of angry men, including, I believe, Constant, are drawn to the auditorium by word of mouth. The meeting fills Odd Fellows Hall, a lodge on Camp Street near Lafayette Square. I am trying to imagine my way into the room. It is June and the scene is a hot hall with 200 or more men. Cigars for the rich, pipes for the common. Drinks go around, wine or liqueur for Creoles, ale or lager for Anglos and Germans. The voices are high from the drink and from the cause. Music warms the crowd. Maybe a band plays Dixie or the newer standard, a good old rebel soldier. Alcibiade de Blanc climbs the platform. He gives a speech full of menace. The white camellia will make things good again. Constant seems the man he knows, the man he admires. De Blanc waves a handful of papers. The white camellia has its constitution. Copies of the Constitution are circulated, and the text lays out its principles and rights. The Constitution describes special door knocks and coded greetings to be used by recruits on the street. It gives a script for the induction of members, and it contains an oath of allegiance. The Constitution of the Knights is a white supremacist manifesto. I believe it is the first statement of its kind in the United States. And when we started to talk earlier, I pointed out several manifestos of white supremacy that circulate as recently as last year in uh, uh, events of mass murder. To read through this document, which Constant would have done, I am somewhat disgusted and also fascinated. Alcibiade de Blanc takes a page and reads aloud from the text, brothers, 
you're being initiated into one of the most important orders which have ever been established on this continent. Our main and fundamental object is the maintenance of the supremacy of the white race. History and physiology tell us that we belong to a race which nature has endowed with an evident superiority over all other races. The maker intended to give us over inferior races, a dominion from which no human laws can derogate. It is a remarkable fact that as a race of men, that as a race of men, <laughs> the Caucasian is more remote from the black African than any. And the more fatally stamped with inferiority is the black African race to its sons which if irrevocably dooms them to eternal imperfectibility and degradation. <clears throat> the knights of the white camellia were costumed and hooded. They harassed people. They conducted night raids. They whipped people. They carried out individual killings. Between the summer of 1867 and the presidential election in the fall of 1868, their attacks left 1,750 people dead or wounded in Louisiana, 90% of them black, according to an accounting made by the U.S. Army, the agency known as the Freedmen's Bureau. According to court records, an attempted coup by the Klan is among the incidents in which my great-great-grandfather found his claim to glory. In March 1873, after an election, LeCorn joined a putsch against the state government. When he was at home that night before leaving for the action, he said goodbye to his wife, Gabrielle, and their four children, all younger than 12, because he did not expect to return. In the nighttime attack, LeCorn and an armed gang of 20 surrounded a police depot in New Orleans, shot it up and seized the building. Theirs was one fork of a two-pronged mission. A second group stormed the city's main armory, but failed to overcome its U.S. Army defenders. LeCorn's gang held its position, however, and a standoff ensued for days with the military camped nearby. If the Klan could bring down the Louisiana government, even for a week, then the U.S. Army which shored up the new and precarious civil rights laws could be forced to withdraw from the state and white rule might be taken back. The army stormed the building and one man was killed. LeCorn and the others were charged with treason and with violating the Ku Klux Klan Act. In Washington, Congress had hoped its 1871 Klan Act would stamp out the white gangs in the South. The penalty for Klan behavior participation was five years. The penalty for treason was hanging. Constant Le Corne was not the only one in the family who fought for white rule. His cousins, his nephew, his brother-in-law joined him in the coup attempt. In addition, several of his French cousins with the surnames Liverday and Lesch played greater or lesser roles in the militia with the medieval name, the Knights of the White Camellia. In the treason case, the gallows were being argued when a sympathetic white judge dismissed all counts, freeing LeCorn and his co-conspirators. So he returned to the street and to the fight. Now, if you believe that to have a Klansman among one's relatives is a strange or a deviant thing, think of this. In 1925, this photograph is from the 1920s, the Ku Klux Klan could claim 5 million members, white and Christian. It is likely that for publicity reasons, this number was exaggerated. So let's assume Klan membership actually stood nearer 4 million. The descendants of 4 million Klansmen living in 1925, if you count forward 100 years, to their grandchildren and great-grandchildren in the year 2025 adds up to about 135 million living white Americans. 135 million 
form 50% of the white population of the United States, which is to say that one of two whites have a family link to the Ku Klux. Every other white person, if he or she knew the names of ancestors and wished to write and find out about their lives, could produce a clan family memoir. For example, the 45th president of the United States, who was the son of a man named Fred C. Trump, who was arrested in May 1927 in Queens, New York, at a march staged by the Ku Klux Klan. It was Memorial Day, and the Klan marchers, wearing robes and hoods, numbered about a thousand people. Fred Trump was 25, and he lived in the Jamaica section of Queens. The 45th president, if he possessed the skills of reading and writing, could himself produce a family history entitled Life of a Klansman. Now, why retrieve from obscurity this bitter and bloody story about Constant Le Corne, a foot soldier in the first white militias? There's a personal motive, and that is that it bothers me. It feels like finding a corpse in a bedroom. I'm disgusted and ashamed. I had an inkling that a great grandfather was a violent supremacist, but I did not see until researching it just what this family member had gotten up to. He was not a thoughtful person. He could write an invoice for his carpentry work, but that's all. He did not develop this idea of white entitlement that still circulates like an odorless gas in the duct work. But God knows he put poison in that gas and he damaged the lives of hundreds of people. But for public reasons, not personal ones, why revive this filthy story and bring it back? One reason is to try to harness the tale of Constant de Corn to repurpose it in some hope of shining a light on the steps ahead. 50 years after the end of the civil rights movement, today, the white and black divide is caustic and fresh. And that is because the US possesses a tragic history. Some of it, white Americans tend to be unaware of. In fact, much of it lies in the repressed parts of collective memory. White supremacy of all kinds is especially willfully denied and forgotten. We come to the end of Reconstruction. <clears throat> the last militia that Lacorn joins is called the White League. It is 1874. During the summer of that year, the White League fighters swell from a fugitive faction of the movement into a mass brigade. And on September 14, 1874, the White League stages a coup in the so-called Battle of Canal Street. The Ku Klux topples the interracial state government. The scene was quite similar to that on January 6, 2021. Thousands of marauders swarming the capital, in this case of Louisiana. In this case also in Louisiana, 35 people are killed. LaCorn is badly wounded during the clash. My Aunt Maud said that he had his head split open. But the White League manages to hold on to the Capitol building for a week. And though the army once again re retakes power, the Klansmen know that they have lost the battle, and yet they have won the war. U.S. troops soon withdraw from Louisiana and from the rest of the South, and by 1876, a white monopoly is again taking shape in the state and the region. Reconstruction ends thanks in part to the Battle of Canal Street. It's the beginning of a hundred years of Jim Crow, the system of color caste. The Klan, in other words, won its fight.
This is me in this photograph standing in front of a monument to the White League in New Orleans, which stood from about 1890 until the year 2017, <clears throat> when it was taken down during the wave of removal of Confederate monuments that followed the massacre in Charleston at the Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church. And yet, this monument, many thousands of monuments, as we all know by now, were erected across the South during the 1890s to commemorate people and episodes of the Civil War. Fewer monuments were erected to commemorate Klan activity. This was one of those, the White, the White League Monument. Now, white supremacy is not a distorted ideology. It is the early build of the nation. It is the United States 1.0. It lies beneath our institutions and in the channels of our minds. The idea of supremacy is not a deformation of thought, but a itself. It is, I believe, the mix of fear, entitlement, anxiety, and a sense of betterness that is felt by many white Americans. I don't exempt myself from this characterization, by the way. 50 years after the end of the civil rights movement, tribal whiteness is once again with us. White identity extremism, white nationalism is very strong in the public eye. In October 2020, the month before the election, the Department of Homeland Security issued a report called the Homeland Threat Assessment, which states that, quote, ideologically motivated lone offenders and small groups will pose the greatest terroristic threat to the homeland with domestic violent extremists presenting the most persistent and lethal threat. The report is referring to the white militias. Now, I have the idea that white supremacy is like a river that runs underground in American history. It feeds the aquifers of our culture. It waters the national soil. But most of us are in denial about it, unaware of this river. I should say that we whites are unaware of it. And again, I'm not exempting myself from this characterization. From time to time, white supremacy erupts on the surface like a geyser out of this river. And then it subsides and returns to its channel underground, but it doesn't go away. I think since about 2015, we are in a geyser phase. I don't think we're in the midst of a return to the barbarism of the race wars of the Old South during Reconstruction, but there is little doubt that we are in a period of aggressive whiteness and anger. I said that the Klan won 150 years ago. I mean that the Ku Klux and people like Constant Le Corne made whiteness an invisible norm. Supremacy is natural, and it was made so in part by events like the ones in this story. Le Corne's life and choices, here he is as an old man, <clears throat> helped to cement white over black during a time, Reconstruction, when white domination was under threat. After the Klan won the race battles of the post-Civil War South and the Jim Crow caste system was locked down, everyone knew that restoring whiteness to power following its years of retreat was the movement's lasting achievement. And so this marginal man, my great-great-grandfather, touches the fingertips of current politics. His life makes visible the class resentments, the desire for ethnic purity, and the free-floating fear that underlie extremes of whiteness. It is persuasive to me that much of the hostility of white racial identity, which announced itself in the first Klan campaigns, 
can be compared with events in the present. By telling the story of Constant Le Corne, I am trying to make whiteness visible and substantial, trying to draw the thing up and out of myself and into view, trying to make it as conspicuous as blackness is, for example. Many whites, I understand, find it uncomfortable to speak about whiteness. We dislike being labeled members of a race. We dislike acknowledging that race is power. That is partly because the Ku Klux and people like LeCorn succeeded in the redemption. They made whiteness the norm, part of the atmosphere. Supremacy is natural. Now, if you think that I'm flattening all difference, making all white people the same as Klansmen, please excuse me, I don't want to do that. However, I have the idea that there is white supremacy and there is white supremacy. There is violent supremacy. And all the way across the spectrum, there is a kinder, gentler, father knows best whiteness. It's atmospheric and it permeates the social common. I think that as soon as I stop talking, someone's going to ask, what can I do? What is to be done about white supremacy? And one answer is uncomfortable. And that is to see it not as an alien phenomenon, but as something familiar, something familial. I wrote this book, Life of a Klansman, in an effort to see whiteness as something familial and for other reasons. But things are not only familial, they are tribal. It's an unfortunate truth that whites in general are heirs to and beneficiaries of white supremacists and their terror, because these acts were and are committed in our name. They are crimes perpetrated for our benefit. And they succeed today in accruing advantage to white life the actions of the Klan long ago, and also grotesquely the ones in recent years. I do not think we are in the midst of a return to the barbarism of the race wars of the Old South during Reconstruction. In fact, I think we have reason to feel optimistic. Yesterday, as Steve pointed out, was the one year anniversary of the killing of George Floyd. That is not something to feel optimistic about. However, last summer, the mass marches showed the country something new. After the killing of Floyd, some 20 million people demonstrated in the street for weeks, sometimes months. Among the marchers were perhaps one third white people. That is without precedent. During the civil rights campaigns of the 1960s, the particip participation of whites was at a ratio of about one to 10. Last summer, the whites who marched are whites who may be seeing their own racial identity in a new way, which is reason for optimism. So there is reason to hope, and I do have hope. My Aunt Maud told me about the redemption. My grandfather, Constant Le Corne, he was a redeemer. Do you know about the redemption? The redemption was a return to order, the right order. The redemption was when the white man was put back in the seat of power. We have had, it might turn out to be, a kind of mild redemption. We have passed, since the inauguration in late January, a kind of turning point. It may not be a redemption full stop but I believe that the white militias and their silent supporters are in the process of being turned back. To end, I'm gonna read another page from this book. This is um, <clears throat> three or four paragraphs that follow the scene at the Mechanics Institute massacre that I described earlier 
1866 when 200, 200 black people were killed, some of them by fire companies, among whom the evidence suggests that Constant Le Corne was one. Many who flee the scene and run several blocks are chased, caught, and beaten to death. Policemen stop the passing streetcars and drag black passengers off to be beaten or killed. If he is on the scene, and I believe he is, I imagine Constant might feel 20 things. He has some emotions that might include fear, pride, duty to power, jealousy, anger, masculine insecurity, anxiety, ambition. Constant Le Corne is one of my people. He's one of my family. How can I respond to the discovery of what he seemingly did in several ways? I do not feel responsible for the crimes he seems to commit. I mean, legally responsible for the reason that the living cannot control the acts of the dead. In the frame of the law, I do not feel culpable for the Mechanics Institute massacre. However, as a matter of conscience, I feel implicated. I feel associated with this cruel and merciless festival of violence, and I feel a part of it because he acts on behalf of his family, our family, if you like. I have a feeling of wretchedness and shame. The family I share with Constant is remote. He is a great, great grandfather. Everyone has. 16 great-great-grandparents, and Constant to me is one of those 16. But disavowal like this is a kind of stage of grief. To disavow is to know that something is true and terrible, and yet to desire that it not be true and act as though it is false. To disavow is to push away a horror the reality is that Constant, my grandmother's grandfather, is a murderous actor on behalf of his family, on the behalf of us. And it is a vile taste in the mouth. I must own it in some way. He was a fighter for our gain, for my benefit. And to say anything else is to prevaricate. It is not a distortion to say that Constant's rampage 150 years ago helps in some impossible to measure way, to clear space for the authority and comfort of whites living now, not just for me and for his 50 or 60 descendants, but for whites in general. I feel shame about it. That is not a distortion either. Whites are my people, my tribe. They were Constance people, his tribe. In that way, he belongs to us and to hundreds of millions. I know the honest way to regard race violence in the, is this. American history is full of it. It is pandemic. The United States was founded upon racial violence. It is within the core of our national identity. Here is a way not to see these events. The marauders like Constant are immoral, abject, and bad people. They are not like us. They belong to someone or something else. It is truer to say this, the marauders were and are our people, and they fight for us. Thank you for staying with me during this hard journey of a story. The rest of the story is in this book. And I'll leave it there, take a break, and ask if you all have any questions or comments that you would like to share. Edward, uh, I want to I thank you. Um, having read the book, you did such a masterful job pulling the story out and telling the story and making it accessible and meaningful. Um, and there's so many directions one could go in, in this conversation. And you know, one of the first things that struck me, I'm so glad you finished with that reading because when I read the book, it really, that was a searing passage that I thought really pulled it together. Again, because the question I think in this time and place in this country is how do we grapple with this? And you have people say, well, that was way back then and I, it wasn't me and it wasn't my role. How could, you know, it, to the spectrum of people feeling truly responsible. And I thought that passage in the book really kind of 
places you at the center and how do you grapple with this legacy? Right. So being able to personalize it and make it intimate kind of on behalf of all of us um, yeah. really stood out to me. Good, good. Um, art. I'm, I'm also struck as, I'm, and I can't remember the month last year when the book was published and when I was re read it because just listening to you tonight, I wanna say it was last summer or last fall and it was before everything around the election got so keyed up. And, you know, there's a, a parallel, like the militia-ness and the tribalness that kind of went hard into election season and out of it and culminated on January 6th um, was so shocking and disturbing. But the parallel, when you're telling, retelling that part of what uh, Constant was part of back then, it is just searing how yeah. the same it is and it is. Right. disturbing and challenging and, you know, this whole question, are we making progress? Can we get beyond? Can we move forward? Can we get beyond over our history? It just, that really stood out to me yeah. in your retelling tonight. Yes, it, it feels sometimes like we're reliving reconstruction <laughs> year by year, month by month. Some of the events of recent times resemble very closely the events of this period when the clans were running rampant. I think there's a power to in, in this family story that you share um, is one that's so, I don't say over the top, but it's so egregious. I mean, it is the clan. It's not just subtle racism, it's participation in the clan. It's owning, owning slaves. And, you know, I think, so it, I don't wanna say it's extreme, it's a really predominant thing, but I think it really helps bring out some of these issues. And uh, you, you get the term, you know, there's a spectrum here, you know, in terms of, responsibility, how we carry it forward. And what's what another really striking thing is your statistic about the Klan participation in the country. You know, again, where does Maine fit into this national dialogue? The Klan had a huge presence and a huge, huge influence here. One of the things folks will see in their, the exhibit when it opens tomorrow is one of the Klan robes. But I've traveled around ah. the, the state uh, extensively and lots of even rural communities had this participation. Now here it was less, it wasn't explicitly about X, it was anti-Catholic anti-Irish, anti-immigrant. So it had its own mojo, but the statistics yeah. and the, the, the broad sped um, mentality, racism, however you want to put it, is here too. So we, again, we all own it in, yeah. in ways. And because Maine people have a perception is this white state up in the corner, it was True. immune in some way, it's not, you know? And, and so there's deeper and subtler ways that we have to look at that. And, you know, again, yeah. that's part of the, what our exhibit is trying to do. Good, good. Yeah. Yes, I, I was aware that Maine was this kind of stronghold of the 1920s clan. And uh, I'm glad that you're bringing that story up and out in your current show. Yeah. Well, um, I think, you know, the, the, the comments we're getting are just um, just lots and lots of thanks and appreciation for um, sharing the story and doing it in such a, a, a masterful way. Um, it provides such insight. And I think, again, the question for all of us is, what can we personally do? And um, I really appreciate the way you yeah. have kind of opened up that. So really, thank yeah. you for being part of this.